they were the girliest the girls I've ever come across. <laughs> I remember one time we were playing a game and the girls were literally sat on the floor in the middle of the pitch talking about their hair and their nails and the ball was coming and he like ran off to the side of the pitch to get out of the way and then met up again in the middle <laughs> to carry on talking about their hair and the nails. So that's a, a memory that will live with me forever. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he turned some of the biggest princesses I've ever seen into absolute bulldozers. Really? Like by the end of, yeah, by the end of like a couple of seasons with them, the girls, they just, they were, we were really good to be fair. We competed in a boys league actually and ended up winning it. Hello and welcome to We Are Chelsea, a podcast brought to you from the Chelsea women's team. I'm Kaz Demores and today we have a special episode on how it started with Jess Carter. We'll be covering it all from growing up playing rugby in the Midlands to becoming a lioness and one of Chelsea's top players. This is Jess Carter. Well, Jess, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for coming on. Can you, first of all, set the scene of where we are for the listeners? I think we're in Chelsea men's press room, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's a nice little press room. It's super chill here. It is chill. I was saying earlier that I've never actually been this side. Yeah, I don't really ever come up here, to be honest. <laughs> what is it like, though, in press conferences and all the media are sat down there and you're up here? Like I said, I don't have to do it that often, really. <laughs> to be fair, I find it normally pretty easy on the few times I have done it because they're only asking me questions about things I already know. So, okay. um, yeah, I'm... I'm not too, I don't get too nervous about doing media or anything like that with, you know, other people in the room. Okay, that's good. Yeah. I'm getting laid back, chilled vibes. Yeah, yeah, very, <laughs> very laid back, chilled vibes. Can you, I want to start from the beginning because obviously you've been here for six years, but I want to go back to the beginning. What was little Jess like? Can you paint a picture? Wow. Grow, how did you grow up? Where did you grow up? And what were you like? Oh, we're really throwing it back. Um, <laughs> so I grew up, it, I grew up. I grew up in a little village called Barford in the Midlands near Leamington Spa um, and um, one of seven kids um, and just kind of, I don't know, really energetic, really bubbly, played every sport I could possibly play um, and then my parents made me choose between two and went to football and rugby and then gradually went to just football um, and yeah, just really quite an active kid really. Um, and then obviously at 16, I went to college in Solihull and then played for Birmingham at 16, was there until I was 19. And then I went to Chelsea ever since. She summed it up. Yeah, basically. <laughs> There's not really much more to tell than that. One of seven. <laughs> was everyone very sporty? Um, so we all kind of, we were lived in different households. So luckily it wasn't too crazy. But yeah, for most of me and my siblings, we were very sporty. And if we weren't playing, we were watching. So I'd say it's a very active family. And who did you grow up looking up to and who was maybe inspiring you? Literally just my family, like all of my siblings. Um, I'm pretty close to pretty close to them and they all inspire me in different ways. And um, I'm really lucky enough to have a super supportive family. Um, my parents and I'd like to say we are perfectly dysfunctional. Um, you know, <laughs> As we, we all are. <laughs> we, I think we all, we have a very strange family in terms of trying to explain it to people my closest friend, like friends, like they never really understand my family tree that much, <laughs> but I know that I've, you know, I had a lot of love growing up and so much support and um, yeah, for me, just my family are my biggest inspiration. What number are you in the seven? Six. Ah, yeah. so you're almost Second, a baby. Yeah, almost a baby. Are there many girls? Um, four girls, three boys. Oh, so girls are dominant. Yeah. <laughs> girls are dominant, girl power in yeah, that household. What was it like when you, said, okay, I want to do just football now and I want to concentrate. And at what point did you think, I'm pretty good at this, I could maybe go pro? Um, so at 16, Birmingham had said to me that they kind of needed me to choose between football and rugby. Um, my right. guess was because of, from injury perspective, um, and I chose football and still to this day, I don't really know why, because I think I preferred rugby. I think I was better really? at rugby. Yeah, 100%. Um, I definitely preferred it. I don't really know what, made me choose football really um clearly it was the right thing to do um it's worked out not so bad but um yeah I don't really know I can't remember why I chose it I reckon probably deep down my family probably were like you should choose football because they're all mainly football fans in my family okay. um and I think football was maybe a bit easier to get to as well than what rugby was okay. um because it was a bit further out um and to be honest, I didn't, I honestly didn't really see football as a career until I joined Chelsea. Um, really? Yeah. Because I, for me, football's always just been a bit of a laugh. It's a bit of fun. 
And it was when I joined Birmingham, obviously the league wasn't full time then, mm. I think. So when I joined, um, the players at Birmingham still had, um, were working two jobs. We were training in the evenings, once, maybe twice a week. So it wasn't professional to me. It was just okay. come, you know, do your thing, go home, go hang, hang out with your friends, go to college, whatever. So, and even though it got more serious, like obviously when we played, we played to win, we played to win trophies, of course. Mm. But I don't really think I saw women's football as a as a full time profession until I joined Chelsea, where it went to another level, and I was like, oh, like I've actually really got to like this is my job now. Like I'm not here to just have a kick yeah. around. Like I'm actually going to work. So I guess if I go back slightly, do you remember there being many opportunities for girls in football? No, not at all. Um, I think obviously as we were just saying then, like I don't really remember. Uh, watch women's football or knowing anything about it and Birmingham actually played around the corner from me in Stratford upon Avon for so long and I had no idea I think my dad just kind of came past like a, a poster one time advertising the game and we went along to it but for me I was the only girl playing in my in my grassroots team which was called Woodlows at the time now Warwick um, I was the only girl playing for them until I think it's like 12 where you can't play with the boys anymore and the, one of the coaches at the time um, where he coached my older brother and he was a really, really close family friend and he essentially set up a girls team just so I could keep playing. Because wow. if it wasn't for him, yeah, big up Dean Brandrick. Um, <laughs> if it wasn't for him, I probably would have stopped playing because there was no other opportunities in the in the local area of and, you know, trying to get, you know, how was a 12 year old supposed to go and play all the way in Birmingham when like, I'm gonna catch the bus by myself at 12 that yeah. far? Or I mean, maybe some 12 years old do, but I would not be doing that. Um, I don't think my mum would be trying to do that. <laughs> so yeah, so if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have played really. Um, and he created a girls team and it was essentially me and then his daughter and then just our friends. I remember like they were the girliest of girls I've ever come across. <laughs> I remember one time we were playing a game and the girls were literally sat on the floor in the middle of the pitch talking about their hair and their nails and the ball was coming and he like ran off to the side of the pitch to get out of the way and then met up again in the middle <laughs> to carry on talking about the hair and the nails so that's a, a memory that will live with me forever um but yeah and then it just kind of grew from there and definitely by the end of my time at, at Warwick um so when I was around 15 10 and 16 there were so many more girls teams in the area and even to just see the growth in the, f the three or four years there is incredible so to see it now 10 years on is, is amazing to see what how many more opportunities there are there it's incredible I do love that even though they just wanted to talk about their hair and their nails, they still went. Yeah. And they still were on the pitch. They were like, we're all just different. Yeah, literally. <laughs> and what was my, I don't know how Dean, I don't know how he did it, but he turned some of the biggest princesses I've ever seen into absolute bulldozers. Really? Like by the end of, yeah, by the end of like a couple of seasons with them, the girls, they just, they were, we were really good to be fair. We competed in a boys league actually and ended up winning it. Um, so I don't know how it happened, but they were no longer talking about their hair and more, <laughs> squishing mud on their faces <laughs> um were you ever rebellious as a child i wouldn't say i'm re i wouldn't say i was rebellious i i, I think my problem i say my problem <laughs> um i've always been encouraged to um say what i gotta say and okay. my dad is possibly um the the best it's probably the best and the worst advice i've ever had for my dad um <laughs> which really, is yeah to say what you gotta say, <laughs> always be, always say your truth. And he didn't quite teach me the part of there's a time and a place for that. So <laughs> we must have skipped that step as a, as a youngster. And, um, you know, so I think that I'm quite an, I'd say I'm quite an opinionated person really. Like it's, um, so yeah, I've had to learn the hard way to pick and choose the timing of that for sure. <laughs> and now let's talk about the decision to come to Chelsea and you, spoke there about how before it was a hobby and then here you realized that the standards were different and you needed to up your game how did you manage that change I mean, didn't play me so I had to do something <laughs> different really to be honest um I, obviously the first year I joined it was to it was really easy totally fine um I think when you first join a new team you maybe have a little bit of leeway and you know your coaches maybe aren't quite on your back they're letting you um you're young they're letting you build your way in etc it's the second year that kind of hits it's it's then where you're still not playing you're um are you even making the squad uh let alone the bench and i think that those sorts of things you just kind of gradually learn and at some point you get tired of not playing 
and you either fight for it or you move on to something different. And mm-hmm. at the, you know, to start with, I was really enjoying my time at Chelsea and I didn't want anything different. I wanted to stay here. I love the girls. I think the, the dressing we've had at Chelsea mo- mainly over the years has been incredible. Um, obviously there's sometimes it's not, but as a whole, it is pretty awesome. So, you know, it's a group of girls I love playing with. And um, I guess it just got to a point where I had to almost decide, do you want to, I guess, improve and play, Mm -hmm. or do you just want to coast? Which I'd say for a couple of years, there was a period where I was a bit of a coaster. I was like, I'm just here, I'm trying, I'm doing my job, but I didn't really go like the extra step to prove why I should play. It was just like a, oh, play me, don't play me. I don't really kind of care, but very laid back approach, which maybe if I'd have um, tried a little bit earlier, tried not, I tried hard. Like, I don't think anyone would say I didn't train hard or anything Mm. like that, but my my problems were always off the pitch my nutrition my recovery my gym everything like that okay. i didn't live like a professional outside of football and that's kind of what contributed to um i guess my up and down time at chelsea really do you think it is hard though if you've come from the mentality of it's a hobby and then you have a short window where this isn't just my job but there's expectation there's pressure and you have to change your whole lifestyle as well as your mentality because there sometimes can be a security in being laid back and going i know i have talent and potential and if i had tried i could have been great but i did and there's like a comfort in going i know i could have because trying could also mean failure and sometimes people don't want that failure I do, I do agree with what you say I think it depends on the person I think for me that when I was at Birmingham I played every game and we didn't have the luxury of having a really big squad so okay. my game time was I knew I was playing whether I no matter how I kind of performed now I wouldn't say I was ever a I never I didn't ever not try so when I was on the pitch I gave my absolute all when I trained I trained as hard as I could it was okay. then when I stepped away from the pitch when I was at Birmingham it wasn't it didn't feel like it was that professional. So I'm like, I could go and do what I want off the pitch. Right. So it was never about trying. It was about, um, not, I guess not knowing what it, t- what it took to be a professional because I never yeah. had to do it. Yeah. So I do remember a couple of times when I was at Birmingham, I remember Kaz Carney having a bit of a conversation to, I guess like just trying to make me realize what it takes to be a professional. And it's not that I didn't respect what she had to say. It's that I'm like, I'm, I'm 16, I'm 17. I'm just like, I'm just having fun. Like it, to me, it was just, I understand what you're saying, but we're at two very different places. I'm here just trying to have a good time. And yeah. she's here trying to be the best footballer that she could possibly be. And that's not where my mindset was at. So I think it's just different points in your career. And obviously when I came to Chelsea, it was that I had to reach a level that I didn't even know almost existed mm-hmm. because I didn't know the, about the other professional side of Chelsea of, of football. Yeah. So I had to try and quickly get up to pace with something that I didn't even know like I'd have to do almost um I thought that everywhere was going to be like Birmingham because I didn't know any different um so I think I just had to quickly try to learn what it took to be considered a professional um and to get to like I I knew I without sounding like arrogant I knew that I was one of the better defenders in the team so for me it would be a well why am I not playing when I'm a better defender than someone else sort of thing but I was so unfit for like three years of being at, at being at Chelsea. I was super unfit. Um, so almost Emma playing me, I was almost a guaranteed sub by like 60 minutes because I just wasn't fit enough to sustain the intensity that was required to play for Chelsea. Um, which is strange when I played every minute for Birmingham. Yeah. But then I was also 16, a teenager who's got a bunch of energy and can just run around. Yes. The older you get, we all know you don't have that natural energy anymore. So I was talking yes. as if I'm much older than 26. I know. But I know. It, it does affect you are, even, a, even I at 26. I am much older than 26, <laughs> so I can confirm that's true. <laughs> so how much of an impact, I guess, did Emma have on that change of the things off the pitch and stepping up the level and I guess helping you mature in the mentality that if this is your job, there's, you know, giving that 2% outside on in the gym on nutrition on lots of other things could actually help you on the pitch by like I don't know 25 percent yeah no for sure I think she was big in that because of um it was basically we ended up having a conversation of you like you're not fit enough um and it was like that's why you're not playing because you're not you're not fit enough and you know we at Chelsea since I've been here we have been in Champions League every every year 
So we have three games a week for most of the season. And I'd be lucky enough to play one of those, let alone be available for three of them. So it was like, if I want to play here, if I want to really, really compete, then I needed to get fitter. And getting fitter is the nutrition. It is recovering properly so I can play again. Mm. It is doing the gym so that uh, my, my body can is strong enough to sustain the pressures of football and the intensity. So it was all focused around f fitness. And I think that it was, I think fitness is a really, really sensitive area to talk about because we've, I've been part of teams before where they talk about your body weight, your body image. And mm. for me, that's the worst thing because I don't care what you look like, how much you weigh, as long as you're fit enough to play football, then that's to me the most important thing. So that is something that I really, um, I think thank Chelsea for really is the way they manage that situation because trying to talk to a 19, 20 year old girl about their body image and mm. things like that, that's such a difficult area to do. And I mean, even at 26, 40, 50, it's not a nice yeah. thing to talk about. So to kind of really sensitively talk about that topic just to get me to be fitter, not thinner and yeah. be to help me be the best athlete. I think it was something that I will definitely always be thankful of Chelsea for, for sure. Give us a, a sense of what Emma is like. I've never, obviously, I've never been in a Emma Hayes team talk. You have been in many. Depends who you ask, really. <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, it's, um, it depends on the game. I think that the ultimate factor for Emma is she wants to win. And we win, a, I guess we kind of win at all, all costs. And it's a winning culture at Chelsea. So it's about trying to find a way to win. And definitely, in, in my experience over the years, it's gotten a bit more like... I wouldn't, negative really isn't the right word, but it's like, she's she'd be happy and proud that we've won, but she always expects more. She always wants more, always expects better. And even when it's good, it's it can be better. So I don't think, it's definitely not about it being negative. I just think that she has um, such high expectations of us as a team that she always wants us to do better. Um, okay. And ultimately, you know, we want to win Champions League. It's the one trophy we've not won. In order to do that, we've got to be better. So I think it's we, she's always trying to find smaller margins for us to push on and you know and win again and again, which is the hardest thing to do. So yeah, she I'd definitely say she has high standards in that side of things. I can't imagine. I can imagine, but I would struggle with the dedication in and out as I get older. How I guess have you managed to maintain that level and how difficult is it as a player to keep up that kind of self-discipline I think it's really it's really hard it's probably the toughest part of the job when um people always think if you're playing you're happy if you're not playing then you're sad it's I can I've played pretty much every game this season and last season and even with international and I can assure you that's not that's mm. not the answer um so I think it's about over time, you just start to figure out what works for you and what doesn't. You start to get the balance right of your social life versus work. And you don't get that right for a long time. I know it took me a very, very long time to get that right. And I think that for me, the most important thing is having the right kind of life away from football because football is so intense and it's like you 100% have more down days at football than you do good days, in my opinion, or in my experience anyway. It's just then you kind of have to weigh up whether the, the highs of it make up for all those down days sort of thing. So I think that when I, you know, when I go home and I get to see my friends and my family and I have a nice apartment and I get to socialize and do those sorts of things, I'm like, you know, everything's great. And, mm. but if you don't manage to get your balance right, then you go home and you just down about football and it's just football, football, football. For me, I need to have a total like, um, a total switch to life after like life after life away from football yeah. in order to to be able to be at my best when I get to football um because I think if I don't switch off I think I will just rapidly crash <laughs> when I get yeah. here to be honest well it is an all-consuming world especially now with social media and the women's game has grown so much that the media attention is now different how do you deal with the negativity that comes with it and the criticism and also I guess the positive sides is just obviously the criticism and the negativity is harder. How do you deal with all of that? Just growing thick skin over a long period of time. Um, I think that similar to everything else, everything just takes time. Like when you're 
I remember, I think it was Champions League final. Oh, good God. I got absolutely slaughtered for so long. I'm like, you try and play against Barcelona women and and beat them. You try and Mark Hansen. Like, I'm pretty sure you're probably not going to do that much better. (laughs) Like, you know, so it's one of those things where you just get, you kind of just have to take it and take it. and, And remember that ultimately I'm not playing football for the fans. I'm not playing football for the keyboard warriors. I'm playing football for myself and myself only. Mm. And ultimately the only people's opinions to me that matter are mine, my teammates, my coaches. They're the people that I play with or that are gonna put me on the pitch. Mm. (laughs) So, and anyone else's opinion, unfortunately is pretty irrelevant. And of course we want our fans to come and enjoy the game. And, but I'm not playing football just for you. So yeah. for me, their opinion is kind of irrelevant on how I'm doing because it's got it plays no impact. We love our fans. We wanna we want them to be there. We want them to come and fill the crowds and things like that. But in my opinion, our fans, you know, we need your support, not your negativity. Yeah. We're not gonna do better with your negativity. And I think that's that goes for a lot of the comments. A lot of half time is just unnecessary and But it's hard like, though, isn't it's, it? It's, it's like horrible. when you're at school and someone's picking on you, you and your mum yeah. goes your mum goes, just ignore them. Yeah. You're like, I, you can't yeah, like I don't follow fans on social media, but it comes up everywhere. Like the yeah. you know, you you have ten great comments but one really bad one and the only and the bad one is the one you remember. Yeah. And it's the same for anything. So you almost just kind of start to almost like blur out the bad comments. And now when I see them, I'm like, I'm not that bothered. Before, obviously it was really tough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just with, I guess everyone just kind of is a little bit different. And you know, some people really struggle with the comments and it can really massively affect their mood, the way they play. Mm. Um, luckily for me, I've learned to have very thick skin and to not be bothered by it. Um, but I can't say the same for everyone now. So yeah. I think that it's really important that, you know, just, you can always, you're a football fan, you can always say your opinion, but you know, there's a right way and a wrong way to speak to someone and yeah. you wouldn't do it in person to them. So why'd you do it on social media? I know there's a confidence, isn't there? I don't know because they, you're yeah. not seeing someone face to yeah. face or they might say something and then they see you and they're like, oh, just come yeah, they're gonna ask. Literally, that's the weirdest <laughs> thing. I'm like, you literally wrote trash about me two minutes ago and now you want me to sign your jersey? Like, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that is, I always think that that is quite funny. Um, Talk to me a little bit about the point for you where things started to click and change at Chelsea and you were like, I feel comfortable. I feel like I've found my groove. Oh, probably about two years ago, maybe it's about three years here. Honestly, we really? got about two years ago and I remember, to be honest, I had a bit of a bust up with Emma actually. We had a bit of a, <laughs> we had a, bit of a set to about, about something and it was just kind of like, it was the, it was actually, I think the um, year we got made the Champions League final. Okay. I think it was that year. I wasn't playing at all. And then we had Bayern Munich away in the quarterfinals, I think it was. Um, someone got injured. There was another red card at fullback. Someone else was out. I was the only fullback left. So what are you going to do now? She kind of ended up, she played me. I 100% believe it was a, you're playing me because you had no one else to play there, really. She might say it was tactical, but you know, that's how I'm going. That's my story anyway. <laughs> so I ended up playing and I was, when I pl- came on, I was like, you know what, you're already not playing. What is the worst that can happen? You don't play well and you go back to the bench. Like it was just, I'd gotten to a, a frame of mind of, I honestly, I passed caring whether you want to play more, you don't want to play more or what other people think. It's about mm. what I can do. As long as I go on the pitch and say, I've given everything, I've done my best, then that's it. And I just played with absolute freedom and no fear of the repercussions of my perform- performance. And it was probably then the best second half of the season I've had for Chelsea. Um, and then I think ever since then, I just was, in, I'm just now in the frame of mind of do what you can and leave the training pitch or leave the game knowing that I'm happy with what I've done. And if that's not enough for someone else, that that's fine. And I think just the freedom of being confident in my own self is what's was the turning point for me, I think. Talk to me a little bit about some of your favorite moments in a Chelsea shirt. Um, I think two probably stand out, maybe three stand out. One was we played, I think it was PSG away um, and Kaz Carney crossed the ball and Mara Mielda popped up at a back post and, and scored and took us through to the, maybe the semi-final, I think it was. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was just an amazing moment. I don't know why that one was so strong for me because I think I'd only just come on like for two minutes before then and we were already in extra time. So I'd been on the bench pretty most of it. But I think like, I don't know how many of you guys know Maren, but she's just the ultimate 
oh, she's amazing. She's an amazing person, amazing player, doesn't get enough credit for sure. And so to see her, you know, score that goal to take us through to the next round was was amazing, um, an amazing feeling. I think buying, uh, maybe buying at home. I think when I, some for some ridiculous reason, I'd got put on set pieces. I'd never done that in my life. And I took this free kick and I think Penilla, I crossed it in and Penilla scored from it. It's probably my best technical action I've ever done. Um, and that was what I think put us two, maybe two, one or two nil up. Um, and then like having players run to me, I was like, well, normally I'm running to everyone else for like scoring or assisting. So that was quite nice. Uh, and then my last one would have to be Leon uh, last, last, was last year. I don't even know what year we're in now. 2024. Yeah, last year. Yeah. yeah, last year, Leon. Yeah, um, when we had the penalty shootout, I think that was just an exciting game. Um, it's exciting to be part of. Ch St Stamford Bridge was just bouncing. It was unreal there. Um, the Leon fans were unreal. Um, Maron again. You know, I don't. I find me anyone who can handle pressure like she can. I don't think there is anyone better. You know, I remember talking to her she, when she was waiting for her first penalty. It was taking ages and I was just stood there and I was talking to her about her hair and our holidays <laughs> and doing everything I could to like not make her think about this really stressful yeah. moment. And we were just having a good old chit chat about absolute nonsense. And she just rocketed it, top bins, and then did the same thing two minutes later in the penalty shootout. And then, you know, I I don't take penalties. And then I was the fifth, the fifth in line. And it wasn't until I realized afterwards, I was like, you were the fifth penalty taker that if I'd have messed that up, that was kind of a big thing. And then Anne goes and pulls out that stop in, uh, against Lindsay Horan and does a little shimmy, which I've never seen in, <laughs> in, in our lives. I, you know, I don't know. I've never seen a show that much enthusiasm. So <laughs> that, that day as a whole was incredible. I love sure. that. Yeah. And shimmying is yeah. what's going to stay with me though. <laughs> if I speak to her, I'd be like, could you just show me the shimmy? <laughs> um, talk to me about what it's like playing at Stamford Bridge. When we've got a big crowd, it's absolutely unreal. I think that it's just, it's so amazing to hear the fra hear the crowd cheering, chanting. They're so, they're so pumped up for it. It just, it does send you goosebumps. It does like, it gets you really excited for, to play the game. And hopefully we can just keep having big crowds at games and making, um, you know, making Stanford Bridge a real fortress for, for us as a, as a team playing and hopefully making it somewhere that the fans want to keep coming back to. But you must have seen it grow especially after the Euros, you must have seen that the fan base is growing, that people are turning up in bigger numbers for yeah, games. Yeah, for sure. Like the, the the fan base across the WSL as a whole has gotten incredible. I mean, I think about Bristol, they had a, they had 10,000 at one of their games this season and no disrespect to, to Bristol, but they haven't achieved as many trophies as yeah. say what we have. And yet they get more... Um, fans to the, some of their games than what we do with some of ours so it just goes to show that the level of women's football is getting so much better and the fan bases is getting so much bigger and it's not about what team you are what you've won or who you are it's just about the growth of the women's game getting so much bigger that people want to come and be part of it so it's incredible to see and hopefully it'll just keep um, improving you've won the euros and played in a world cup final with the lionesses how proud are you of your achievements and when you think back to when you were playing for Warwick, could you have even dreamed that this would have happened? No, I mean, I didn't ever think I'd be a, a female football player, let yeah, alone a, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let alone um, achieve that. No, it's, it is incredible, and I think my international journey has been even rockier than my than my club <laughs> journey. So, to have not been in the England setup really consistently, um, unlike a lot of the girls' journey to then get to a Euros and get to a World Cup for me is. It is, it is incredible. And I think for me, I, I never, my ambition was never to play international football. I think in a documentary, you've had, you'll hear me say, like, I'm not that bothered about playing for England because my focus was always just club. If I can't play for club, I can't play for country because, right. you know, you've got to be competing yeah. on a regular basis here in order to get selected. And so that was never a focus of mine until it, until I was, until it was, I guess, until I got yeah. selected and selected and selected and selected. And now I'm like, oh, actually, that's this really is this yeah you. now it's um you know i've got to try and keep myself in the best place possible in order to compete for both club and country are you a goal oriented person in like you set yourself goals or things like that i mean i, I i'm asking this knowing <laughs> that you're gonna go no no i'm really not um maybe it's 
I don't know if it's a downfall or I mean, it's gone me so far, but yeah. I'm just, I'm not bothered by setting goals. I'm just kind of like literally take each day as it comes. And I think that it's just about focusing on what I can do today. And then when I wake up tomorrow, what can I do tomorrow? And for me, that's the best way to prep. I don't like to think about the future things. I just think so many things can happen in football that can change the, change the course and, so I just think about focusing on the each day as it comes, really. Well, it's interesting because I was going to say, what does the future look like for Jess? <laughs> and what is left for you to achieve? But I guess that answer reminds me a little bit. I spoke to Jack Grealish once and he said that he would fly high when things were going really well. But he would equally drop when things are going really badly. And he had to, it took him a long time to find the equilibrium. Yeah, And it sounds like by taking each day as it come, you're living in the present in order to try and find. I think that's what it is. I think that maybe subconsciously, I'm not setting my standards too high to maybe not have to go so low if they don't go right. But for me, it's always just been take each day as it comes. And then when we're successful at the end of the year, I will be celebrating all of the happiness that I've <laughs> built up throughout the year all at once. <laughs> I mean, sat here with you, Jess, you just seem so normal and down to <laughs> earth and I'm like but you go to red carpet events you're like nominated for these things you're winning these incredible tournaments Remember, I still get my dress from boohoo it's like <laughs> we, we all could go to the same places I might be going but I still have to pay for my own cab to get there we're on the train in my heels so <laughs> I mean I just I love that mentality you're just you're great to be around, but in my head, I'm like, how do you stay so normal? You've got fans asking for your pictures. You've got people asking for autographs. You, you, you won the Euros. Oh, and my, my, like I said before, my family, they keep me very humble. My sister will call me midway through a game and ask me what I'm doing. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll get a text saying, why haven't you answered your phone? I'm at a game. Like, they really keep me humble. My mom will text me just before I'm about to say go out to say good luck. Like, mom, I didn't see your message until after the game. Like, I'm... I was already preparing for a game. You know, they, they just keep me so humble. Um, one sister cares more about what her hair looks like today than anything else. And they're just, so, I've got such a humble family that it really helps me to stay grounded, really. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, good luck. It was yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jess, I have absolutely loved speaking to you. You have just been unreal. <laughs> I need like Fran as my life coach and then I need you to just keep me grounded. Yeah, for <laughs> two very different people. Fran is very winning driven. Fran is very focused about she wants to win, win, win. Um, and we will do it, otherwise we won't play. And yeah. We just have different ways of, I guess, going about it. And that's, I guess, what makes Chelsea work so far is having very, very different personalities. <laughs> How would you describe Fran on the pitch? Uh, she asked me to uh, ask you this. I asked her, and she was like, "Do you want to ask Jess?" Oh, uh, very competitive. Um, yeah, competitive. Does she shout lots. Um, she does. <laughs> to be fair to her, she probably shouts more at herself than she does at at the others. But she's just got such high standards for us, and you know, you don't ha you don't play for Chelsea if you don't have high standards. And yeah. when people aren't doing the basic things right she will let you know that you're not doing the basic things right. But equally, she'll be very quick to praise you. So as you know, she she wants to win and winning at all costs. And But she's ultimately a great teammate as well though, because she does back your case when things also aren't going so right and will be on your case because she expects you to do better than what you're doing right now. I love that. Yeah. My last question to you, is just a personal one because I'm Hit very me. curious. Um, it's nature versus nurture. Do you think you're more likely to become a successful athlete, footballer, if you you just have the natural ability or do you think if you're nurtured? Do nurtured. you think it's natural? Nurtured? Yeah. I don't think that, I'm a big, big believer in that. Um, I say big believer in the sentence, I don't even know the, sen the saying. <laughs> um, was it hard work beats talent if talent doesn't work hard, something like that? Yeah, it is Yeah, that. that one, because I think we've seen many talented players not be as successful as they should be because of their attitude to the game or their lack of willingness to improve, work harder. And, you know, for me, uh, people talk to say to me about natural talent because of maybe what I achieved at a young age, but I don't have the technical ability that most of my teammates have. God, I go to, sometimes I go and we play Wondos and I'll spend most of my time in the bloody middle because I give the wall away the most. 
And it's like, I know that that's not my best strength, but I know what I can give you is 100% work rate. I can support my team. I can try and organize my team. I can do all those other things that maybe someone who's got a million percent more talent than I have. And so I, I do think that if you um, are able to just be taught and helped how to be better and do better, I think that's better than natural. You'll get further than just having natural ability. I love that. I mean, I've got a one-year-old, so Project Chelsea Women's yeah. is starting. <laughs> Maybe they have to be a defender though. And not, not, there's a reason I'm no longer playing midfield. So, <laughs> I love that. Jess, you've been an absolute incredible guest. I've loved talking to you. Yeah, thank you. It's been cool. Thank you for listening to We Are Chelsea. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll be back with more episodes with Chelsea's top players.